This is Danny Bobro, president of AIM Dental Marketing, welcoming you to this installment of the Practice Perfection Web-Based Education Series. Today's presentation is entitled, Cardiovascular Disease Prevention Myths, Grow Your Practice While Saving Lives. The largest gap in U.S. healthcare today is a growing underdiagnosis of heart disease. Atherosclerosis is responsible for more than 38% of deaths in women and nearly 33% of male mortality, and is nearly 100% preventable. Because dentists see their patients nearly five times more often than do primary care providers, they represent a vital piece of the wellness puzzle. Identifying additional ways to contribute to overall patient wellness enhances the value dental offices provide their community. Dr. Todd Eldridge is one of the world's leading experts on atherosclerosis and heart disease. He is author of the number one international best-selling books, Cardiovascular Wellness Management Success Plan, and Prevention Myths, Why Stress Tests Can't Predict Your Heart Attack and Which Tests Actually Do. An active researcher involved in many CIMT-related research projects, Dr. Eldridge spent years developing performance-based testing protocols to demonstrate operator-dependent coefficients of variability in testing reproducibility. He spent 10 years at what is now Sanofi Pasteur, where he ran the U.S. Pediatric Vaccine Business Unit. Todd holds MBA and MPH degrees and a PhD in cardiovascular epidemiology. As an attendee at today's event, you will learn about practical tools that will enhance your practice and other tools that are a waste of time in identifying cardiovascular disease in your patients. You will also learn about a painless, non-invasive procedure which requires no disrobing, no additional radiation exposure, and can generate additional profit to your practice, all while saving lives. Today's webcast will run for around 90 minutes. While attendees are in listen-only mode, we invite you at any time to submit your questions or comments using the question button on your screen. We will allow time following the presentation to get your questions answered. If we do not get to your question during the webcast, we'll see that it's answered shortly thereafter. Attendance at this presentation entitles you to apply to receive one and a half hours of continuing education credit. Shortly following the webcast, we will send you an email with instructions for receiving your CE. I want to express my sincere appreciation to Todd for agreeing to deliver his presentation at this difficult time. My, my condolences to you, Heidi, and the rest of your family on the recent passing of your father, sir. Participants are cautioned about the dangers of incorporating techniques and procedures into their practice if the course has not provided them with adequate clinical experience to allow them to perform them competently. And with that, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome to the Practice Perfection stage, Dr. Todd Eldridge. Greetings, Todd. Greetings, Danny, and thank you for that introduction. Are we okay to just go ahead and start? Please. I, I thought it might be helpful, uh, uh, you know, they always ask us to, uh, to have a couple of slides to introduce ourselves. As uh, Danny, I think, already mentioned, um, sorry, I'm trying, there we go. I, I, uh, I've got two books out. Uh, I didn't ever intend to write a book in the first place, but got kind of cajoled into it. And, uh, but they did, they did fairly well. Our most recent book I wrote with a colleague of mine, Dr. Ford Brewer. And, uh, uh, the, the reason we decided to write a book was just, uh, experiences in our own lives that, that caused us to realize that these, uh, diseases were preventable. This is a little uh, factoid about myself. This was uh, me uh, last May 29th. My wife and I and I were uh, taking a small plane up to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and uh, we lost our engine. And, uh, you know, those Grand Tetons are not a great place to be a glider over. And um, needless to say, we, we found ourselves needing to set down. You got about three and a half minutes from the time you lose your engine until impact. We were able to set down, but we both float broke our backs. And, it, it, and it, that experience has brought me back full circle. If, if I was standing in front of you in person, I would have you, some of you raise your, your hands and say, how many of you know somebody who has had a heart attack or stroke? And usually it's about 98% uh, 
uh, of an audience. Uh, the, and, and if you just kind of self-reflect of how many people you know who have had a heart attack or stroke or died from one, and then we'll normally have people start sitting down uh, and, and we get to all the way to how many of you have a close family member uh, uh, that, that has had a heart attack or stroke or died from one. And we still, in most uh, audiences, will have 60 or 70 percent of the audience. And the reason is that, that, that this disease is pernicious and it is prevalent. Uh, we tend to talk about mortality which is appropriate, but we have to remember incidents. And, and uh, th this, this disease is extremely prominent, endemic in our, in our population. And what's irritating about it is that it's nearly 100% preventable. For me, this, uh, this uh, effect at a personal level uh, uh, began with, with uh, uh, back in 1977, this is a, probably, it's not a very good picture, but this is a, a newspaper article uh, of a car wreck that my uh, older brother was in and was killed in. And, and for me, it began me on this uh, trajectory, if you will, uh, to, to contemplate mortality took on a very real and significant meaning to me, as it does for anybody that's lost a close member or family prematurely. And I determined at a very early age that I, I really didn't was not going to let anybody that I cared about out of my life again uh, on purpose, you know, for something that's that's preventable. This this case, there was absolutely nothing I could do to prevent this this uh, tragedy from happening. However, years later at a at a Thanksgiving gathering, I, I was uh, doing a fellowship with my mentor, Dr. Gene Bond. And uh, I, I brought this new technology home with me. I was so excited. Uh, and I, so I, I began to scan members of my family. And to my great horror, uh, both of my parents had uh, loaded with disease. And my, uh, my younger brother, who is seven years younger than me, had a huge, um, what they call an echolucid plaque. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. You know, three inches from his brain. And, and, and I remember it taking my breath away because I knew instantly the ramifications of this. And, and so this mantra that heart attacks and strokes can be prevented became very real to me. Today, you'll be happy to know, uh, just so I end the story, my father, as Danny mentioned, just passed away on Monday, not from heart disease, uh, passed away very peacefully and actually died in my arms, a sweet experience. But, but we were you know, able to add 20 or 25 years to his life because uh, we found disease early and, and, and got him uh, the appropriate amount of care. My brother is still with us and was able to raise both of his children to adulthood and uh, is still a commercial airline pilot. And so uh, when we talk about this disease, it's really important that we stay focused on the ability to prevent it. Nobody has to have a heart attack or stroke in this day and age, much less die from one. And I mean that in, in all sincerity. And that, that may shock some of you. I, I wish that I could look in your faces and, and, and uh, see your response to that. That is a true statement. Now, it, it happens to be the leading cause of death for men and women. I, I'm an epidemiologist, so I, I can't help go over some of the, the epidemiology related to this disease. But it's a... Uh, it's responsible for a full 38% heart attacks and strokes, full 38% of the deaths in men and women, more in women, and, and ironically, uh, women outpace men after age 65. So this is a disease that, that affects both the genders. And uh, uh, when we look at, uh, for men and women, 121,000 deaths from heart attack or stroke in this time frame. Uh, it, it, it's, it's it, somebody's, uh, nearly a third of all deaths are from heart disease, 38% as we talk about in women, but somebody's dying from heart disease every 36 seconds. Can you imagine? In the time that we've been talking, there's been five deaths in the United States from this disease for, for something that's combined. When we look at stroke, you know, honestly, uh, death is, is the easy part. The, the problem with stroke is that uh, most people don't die. It, it's the leading cause of disability. And honestly, I don't know about you. I mean, I, I, you know what the number one cause of, of death in the world is. It's a, uh, it's a sexually transmitted condition. It's 100% fatal, no known exceptions. We can't say that it's causative, but it's the highest association we know. It's called birth. 
meaning that all of us are going to cross the uh, rainbow bridge at some point. And so uh, for most of us, death isn't quite as concerning as, as you know, having our children change our diapers, uh, which is not very appealing. And uh, so we have to remember that, that the, the ongoing effects, after effects of these two diseases is much, uh, much more detrimental in many cases than is the actual mortality. Uh, someone has a stroke every 40 seconds and dies from a stroke every four minutes. And by age 60, uh, women outpage men, men. I think I may have said 65 before. 60% never fully recover. Uh, let's just focus on that for a half a second. Uh, the ramifications of not fully recovering from uh, uh, an event that affects our brain. The cost of this is not trivial. Now, I throw up a big number like 351 million, which was uh, the cost in 2014 of this disease to the U.S. Uh, healthcare system. That's a big number. That's a that's a deficit size number. But let me let me put some reality to that there are nearly a half a million homeless people in the U.S. Okay, and if we took that 351 billion, we fixed heart attacks and strokes, and we're going to show how to do that later. Uh, we could buy every homeless person in the U.S. a home worth $700,000. So these are huge numbers. Here's another way to think about $351 billion. There's about 20 million adults enrolled in colleges and universities in the U.S., we could write a check to every one of them at the beginning of the year for 17,500 to, to help pay towards tuition for just the cost of, of, of what we're currently spending on this one disease. Here's one last final word again, because when we talk about 351 billion, that's a big number. There are about 201,000 dentists in the US. We could write each of you a check for $1.7 million every year for what we're spending in the US healthcare system on heart attacks and strokes. So these are huge numbers and I don't want that to get lost. Um, and and the, the sad thing is that it's expected to grow to $1.3 trillion by the year 2035. Now to put that in perspective, we said at 351 billion, we could, write, we could, we could buy every homeless person in the country a home worth 700,000. Well, at 1.3 trillion, we could, buy every one of the homeless people in America a home worth $2.6 million. These are huge numbers, and it's money that's being spent unnecessarily. Um, so one of the things, that, and, and Danny, I don't know, can they see my pointer at all? Yes, we can. No okay, problem. good. One of the things I want you to focus is the number went up, up, up until we, it, in about 1970, we came out with stents and, or statins and stents. That was this reduction right here. And I want you to notice that the trend is moving upwards again. We, we've really done very little to, uh, to eliminate heart attacks and strokes. And I, I have some thoughts on that a little bit later. But right now, I just want you to, to, to spend time with that number and that trend line. You know, this if we follow this using logarithmic, we would see this trend still going up, upward and not down. Um, the mortality trend, this is just since 1980. Again, since 2010, we've been moving upwards for heart attack and stroke. These are terrible statistics. If you put this, these kinds of trends on even COVID, they would be unacceptable. Um, it's 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 taking about in in the United States in men about 535 adults per every hundred thousand, which, which is just way too high. It, it tends to be an industrialized mention uh, a disease, meaning that in the industrialized countries, and part of that is because uh, uh, of uh, McDonald's and Burger King, right? And, and I don't mean to if you, if you happen to own some of those franchises, I don't mean to attack them personally. I'm just saying that our our it, it, forks and furniture, what, what we're putting on our forks and not getting off our furniture is a, is a, a problem uh, endemic in first world countries. Uh, the, the rates for stroke also extremely high and particularly high in the U.S. These, this is a trend line and you don't have to get down into the details here. What I want you to see is that we're not really making, having an effect that essentially we've been using the tools we've been using for 30 years to no avail with very little effect to the trend line of this endemic disease. 
So what we, uh, if, if we were to take away, you know, kind of all of the points, there's a 21% increase globally in cardiovascular disease since 2007, 28% increase in the crude prevalence. Uh, won't spend a lot of time on what does crude prevalence mean. There's a 9% increase in stroke, stroke risk just since 2016. These are updated numbers, 27% increased risk for non-coronary atherosclerosis uh, in people who sleep less than six hours per night. So just not getting enough sleep is one thing we can change. That's a 27% increased risk if you're not getting at least six hours of restful sleep a night. Cardiovascular or coronary heart disease is still the leading cause of death in the U.S. 2.2 uh, million hospitalizations each year. It claims more lives each year than all can all deaths from any kind of cancer and chronic lung disease combined. So this is a pernicious disease. When you stop and reflect that, you know, lung disease. A lot of the cancers are not preventable. They, they, we, we catch them early, but if you get it, you get it. Cardiovascular disease is nearly 100% preventable. Uh, so insanity is, uh, Albert Einstein, is, it's attributed to him saying that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And that's what we've been doing with regards to cardiovascular disease. We've been doing the same thing. And I'm, I'm going to talk more about that when we get into the actual myths. Uh, right now, if I could just kind of refresh your memories on what this, what do we mean by coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease or atherosclerosis. And uh, uh, we'll talk about the clinical pathway. And I think I exposed, expressed this earlier. It's forks and furniture. It's, it's this, it's a sitting on the couch and uh, having our Big Macs and fries. Uh, we're, we're eating the wrong foods and, and we're not moving. Movement is medicine and we're just not doing enough of it. But the disease, sorry about this busy slide. This, this slide actually is interesting to me because it captures the entire disease process all the way through the development of plaque, but it's way too busy for a meeting like this. So we're gonna, we're gonna take this uh, down several notches and talk about the disease, which is uh, not at all unlike facial acne, which is why I've got these gross uh, images on here. The, the, and let, let me explain that, uh, what I mean by that. When we were teenagers, we could feel a, uh, uh, a, a, a pimple forming long before we could see the white splotch in the mirror, the red splotch, right? Because it hurt. That inflammation would raise the skin and there are nerves in there. and We could feel that, that uh, pimple forming long before we could see it in the mirror. And then if you waited long enough, you'd have this soft whitehead pimple that would eventually... Uh, become a cottage cheese-like substance. This disease, atherosclerosis, is very similar, not at all unlike uh, acne, facial acne. So uh, the first thing that happens is that there's endothelial dysfunction uh, in atherosclerosis and involves a series of early changes that precede the lesion formation. The changes include greater permeability of the lipoproteins, upregulation of leukocytes and endothelial adhesion molecules, and the migration of leukocytes into the arterial wall. By the way, the orientation of this is up here. This, this is the one cell thick layer called it the endothelium. It lines all 100,000 miles of vessels in the body. So up here is the lumen where the body, where the blood flows. And down here, you'd see the smooth muscle tissue and then the admin tissue, which would be, which would be down below this media. But um, so right here is our blood flowing. And uh, during the initiation of atherosclerosis, LDL-C accumulates and it gets trapped in the subendothelial. So down here in the intima, it gets trapped in the extracellular space within the arterial wall. And then um, the next thing that happens is that the, the, the local vascular cells mildly oxidize the LDL that's accumulated or trapped in the subendothelial space down here to form, uh, it, it's kind of a minimally modified LDL which is able to stimulate the recruitment of monocytes. Uh, so the monocytes are up here penetrate, penetrating and then they become activated and they turn into macrophages and they start a process called phagocytosis, you remember from your biology classes. These further oxidize the LDL accumulated in the subendothelial extracellular space to, form, uh, to a form that can be scavenged and internalized, meaning that you turn on this killing mechanism that ironically, uh, creates inflammation. 
and so it, it results in the formation of uh, what we call foam cells. And these foam cells form the earliest visible lesions of atherosclerosis, or the fatty streak right, right down here. So all of this gunk, if you, it, again, I hate to keep focusing on kind of a gross metaphor, but, but this is that white pussy material forming uh, subluminal, if you would say, subdermal in the case of facial acne, but subluminal here in the case of, of atherosclerosis. And it, and, it, and it looks very similar. It's that, it's that uh, cottage cheesy substance. And eventually, um, the fatty streak formation in atherosclerosis occurs with the filtration of lipid-laden monocytes and macrophages along with the T lymphocytes. All of that whole phagocytic process begins, which causes heat and inflammation. Later lesions, including smooth muscle tissue, um, a, a complicated series, a whole cascade of steps is involved, including the smooth muscle migration. So it actually gets down into these cells here, T cell activation, foam cell formation, and platelet adherence and, and aggregation to what ends up happening is you get this great uh, big lesion that, that, that bursts into the lumen. Okay, so... Um, uh, it, and 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 w uh, let me just go back here. The the problem when this when this lesion forms, it it releases enzymes into the bloodstream that activate platelets in blood. Uh, just like if you cut the back of your hand, you uh, the platelets in the blood activate and you and it forms a scab on on the the injured uh, area of the skin. Same thing happens here in the arterial wall. So we get an injury that's formed ironically by this pushing upwards and outwards of, of, of these, uh, this phagocytic material, the, these foam uh, cells and enzymes, and they push right into the lumen. And, and so what happens when the platelets are released is that blood tries to heal these wounds and you get a thrombus. So uh, at, at least 50% of the time, it's not the, the actual lesion that causes the event, it's, it's, the, it's the subsequent thrombus that's formed. Um, Okay, so let me, uh, let's just review. This is another busy slide. Please don't feel the need to read. There's nothing in here you need to read. What I want you to pay attention to the arrows and because this will speak to the fundamental problem uh, why cardiovascular disease is still so prevalent in our society. The disease begins in the blood. We have, uh, uh, we have these uh, cells floating through the blood circulating through the, the circulatory like their pathogens, right? They're disease causing like cholesterol. And we can see them first in the bloodstream. But in order for those pathogens to cause problem, they must penetrate into the endothelial wall, which causes diminished vascular function. So as we as we age, one of the things we note that we may not catch our breath as easily. We may we notice uh, that that vascular function doesn't is not as responsive in men. They get uh, erectile dysfunction uh, later in life, uh, and this is an early sign of a compromised endothelium. The last place that we see this disease is in the the physical structural wall of the artery where these lesions form. Now, when we heal the disease through pharmaceutical treatment or whatnot, we see the changes first in the bloodstream, and then we actually should see improvement to vascular function. And the last but not, not least, we'll see, we can actually see physical changes to the, to the arterial wall. We'll see diminished inflammation, as well as structural changes in the actual atherosclerotic lesions. The pimples themselves change in their echolucency from, from a soft whitehead pimple, if you will, to a totally calcified. So these changes uh, are important to understand. We can monitor them. Uh, that hopefully that's enough of a, of a review of this disease to make sure we're all talking about the same things. All right, let's get in. We promised to talk about uh, the myths relating to cardiovascular disease. And the, the most important myth, the, and the myth that is the most common myth, if you, if you poll people in the US, they believe, and there are even physicians in primary care that believe that cholesterol will predict with some amount of accuracy those that are going to go on and have, have a heart attack and stroke. And I will tell you, this is categorically wrong.
it's incorrect. Now, I, I'll have my lipidologist, if they were on here, would take issue with that. I will tell you, LDLC is uh, has a mild associative relationship, not causative. Uh, and and there are some great lipid uh, moieties that that are a little more predictive. For example, ApoB or LP little A. But for the most part, if we look at the, the all of the moieties combined, they are very weak predictors of who is going to actually have a heart attack or stroke. And this is one of the primary problems, because guess what our primary detection tool is in primary care? It's cholesterol. It's a part of the Framingham risk score. It's it. You can't come out of medical school and not know how to do uh, CVD risk assessment. And, and top of the list of risk assessment, uh, a, a an 80 year old technology and 130 year old technology. So the 80 year old is cholesterol is now 80 years old, believe it or not. And the second one is 130 years old now, and that is blood pressure. And I'm not saying that they're not that they're unimportant. What I'm saying is, it, it's insane that we are still using these as our primary detection uh, tools. You know, 80 years later. Okay. So uh, one study by Akasa showed that 75% of the men and 82% of the, of the women are missed and didn't even qualify for treatment using ATP3 guidelines. Let me talk more about this study. This was a group of patients who were lying in their hospital bed. They'd already had a heart attack or stroke. So there's no question about whether they're sick, okay? They, they have had their heart attack or stroke. They're laying in their hospital bed. Somebody got the bright idea, hey, you know what we had to do is we had to draw their blood and see who has, uh, see what their, their cholesterol profile looks like. And here's what they found. 75% of the men, 82% of the women did not even qualify for pharmaceutical treatment using the current ATP3 guidelines. That's insanity. That's the very definition of insanity. So uh, meaning that they would, that if, if we tested, if we didn't know about the heart attack stroke, they wouldn't got, have gotten care. Uh, 122,000 patients in a meta-analysis done by Cotton and, and, uh, and company showed that 15% of women, almost 20% of men had none of the con conventional risk factors. And so our traditional risk factors, which is the bread and butter of, of determining who is and who will not go on to have a heart attack or stroke is really getting people killed. And that is the number one problem. In fact, there, I'm going to talk about one other study I don't have on a slide by Ritker and Associates. He was actually testing a new marker, uh, HSCRP, and it, in 28,000 women studied in a group that went on to have heart attack or stroke, only 46% of that group had elevated cholesterol be beyond 130 milligrams per dec deciliter. And, and so cholesterol, what I hope you take away is it is not going to tell you with any amount of uh, specificity who will and who will not go on and have a heart attack or stroke. Okay, so um, how predictive are these traditional risk factors? We have to remember that atherosclerosis is a multifactorial disease. It's a combination of genetics, there's environmental factors, the air that we breathe, uh, whether whether we're around smokers or not, and then there, all of these work together to have variable outcomes. Um, so the traditional risk factors may not reflect the atherosclerotic process at the arterial wall level, and that's our problem. So a lot of our primary care doctors are doing this. They're in their cockpit thinking that everything looks good, and meanwhile, the uh, the, the aircraft's coming right at them. And, and uh, we have to get our, allow ourselves to become uncomfortable with our traditional diagnostic techniques if we're going to be effective at, at curtailing and changing uh, that curve on, on this pernicious disease. Okay, myth number two, uh, carotid duplex, nuclear stress tests, stress echoes, treadmills, spec and, pe spec and pet e exams, angiograms, they are all effective at screening for CBD. This is false. In fact, my second book is called Prevention Myths, and it's about which, uh, why stress tests can't predict your heart attack or stroke and which tests actually do. And uh, we do 9 million of these tests a year, guys, 9 million of them. And they tell you absolutely nothing about your future risk of heart attack or stroke. What they do tell you is if you're a candidate for surgery today, if we all remember uh, uh, Russert, Tim Russert that passed away, a week after meeting with his cardiologist, it was not that we didn't know he had atherosclerosis. 
He, he passed his stress test with flying colors. For most people, and I'm talking well over 70%, minutes before they have their heart attack or stroke, they would pass every test in the cardiologist's office with flying colors. And that's because, not because they're bad tests and not because cardiologists are bad physicians. It's that those tests are designed to tell the physician something different than what the patient thinks it's telling them. So patients go in believing that those tests are going to tell them if they're at risk for heart attack or stroke. That's not what they're doing. What they're telling us is whether or not I can operate. You have to remember that, that cardio, cardiologists are surgeons. We can't go around cracking people's chests open just to see what's in there. And we can't run catheters up people's legs just to see what's in there. Those procedures introduce risks that are unacceptable for all but the, the very most sick of society. And so this particular study, uh, you know, 86% of the, of the MI, myocardial infarctions are in people with, that have plaque less than 70%. Why is 70% significant? Because 70% is the number you have, you have to exceed 70% before we can ethically run a catheter up your leg or crack your chest open because the risks are higher than the benefits. Once you hit 70% or if you're symptomatic, meaning you're having heart palpitations or, or heart pain, now we can justify introducing some of these risks through sur surgical procedures. But below 70%, we really can't justify it ethically. But the problem is that 86% of the events are in people with less. 68% are in people with less than 50%. Let me tell you the significance of 50%. If you don't have a 50% blockage, you, you don't even show a hemodynamic disturbance in the blood flow when I put an ultrasound up on your neck or your chest. And so these are really important numbers to wrap your head around. The reason is most events are not caused by a pimple that grows so big that it causes a blockage. In the vast majority of cases, what happens is it's a smaller pimple that ruptures suddenly and spontaneously. And when it ruptures, that white necrotic material you would find in a pimple gets pushed up almost instantaneously to the smaller vessels of your brain where it causes a blockage and your brain starves for blood or, blood or oxygen and you have a stroke or to your heart and you have a heart attack. Of course, there's a whole cascade of other things that happen, most often leading to a, to a, a thrombus, but they are all precipitated by a ruptured lesion. So finding a pimple that's so large that it's causing a blockage is not, it's not gonna solve the problem for most people that have heart attacks. So what does that mean? It means that we've sentenced 86% of those that are gonna have a heart attack or stroke to go ahead and have it anyway, because their cardiologists ethically have their hands tied behind their back. Now that should scare us. Now, why is that? This is, a, this is a popular company that goes out, very good company, so please don't take away, we're, we're not dishing this company at all. They, they do great testing. I wish they wouldn't do the carotid test that they do. The carotid test that they do is a duplex, and what it does is it looks for blood flow. Doppler is uh, what we use to track cloud movements. It, 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 uh, it enables us to visualize movement, and in this case, it's the movement of blood, and so, until, until you have a, a blockage of greater than 70%, these waveforms are completely normal. And so it, 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 it's going to catch the 2 or 3% that are in need of surgery today. Yeah, if you fail, get one of these and fail it, you need to go to your hospital today. Do not pass go. Don't wait till next week. You should go directly to the doctor. It's a miracle you haven't already keeled over. But the problem with that is if you're not in that group that has a blockage greater than 70%, guess what comes back on your report? Normal. And for the vast majority of Americans, they see normal on their test and they say, oh, I'm good. So that's why the American College of Cardiology, the American Academy of Fa Family Physicians, virtually every governing body over a group of physicians has asked us to not use this technology to detect who is and, or who will and who will not go out and have a heart attack or stroke should not be used for screening purposes. Why? Because if you're less than 70%, you're going to get a normal and you're not. All right, hopefully that's clear. Uh, the reason is that, that plaque, 99% of the plaque grows away from the lumen. So this is a slice of an artery. 
and just put on a microscope. So this white is where the blood flows. And right here is the plaque, right? So when I blow that up, you can see that that plaque is not even blocking the lumen at all. But here's the problem. You see this thin uh, lumen here, that can rupture at any time and all of this white pussy material get, leaks into the lumen, launching a whole cascade of things that are problematic in terms of uh, a heart attack or stroke. So where, where, where plaque is imaged uh, in IMT, we're not interested at all in what's going through the lumen. So this is now what we've done is look at a carotid artery uh, in a lateral plane so that we're, we're just, so that your head's up here and your, your, uh, your heart's over here on the right and your head's on the left. And if you look, this is a large echolucent plaque right here growing away from the lumen. You can see that this, this vessel may have even revascularized a little bit. See how it's, it's, it's made room for the plaque. And so it's not gonna cause a blockage of blood flow at all. This won't even cause a hemodynamic disturbance. The problem is that if this ruptures and you can see this is really soft over here, that can just seep out into the blood flow. And when it seeps out, that's gonna introduce enzymes that will activate the platelets and you start your thrombus forming. So these are sneaky little guys and they're launching a whole cascade of things that all of which could lead to either a heart attack or stroke, depending where it is. Okay, I think we've beat that dead horse. This is, a, this is a, my mentor in my fellowship was a pathologist uh, taught uh, medical school at uh, Wake Forest University for School of Medicine for 30 years. This is a, a patient that died from an acute myocardial infarction. But what you, I want you to see is this plaque, uh, this is a thrombus. This is probably what got this, this uh, cause death is this big thrombus. The plaque, you can see there's plenty of lumen left, but these plaques are unstable. And when the blood's pulsating uh, at a high rate, it, it can pull that, this whole gob of goop, so to speak, it can pull it right off its where it's adhered to here and, and up to the smaller vessels, and then you have a problem. So that's what's causing the vast majority of, event, uh, of events. Okay, I promised we would cover three myths. The third myth is that there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, uh, three years, four, four years ago, we did a study of, of a thousand people, and we, we asked people um, about uh, if heart attacks and strokes were preventable, most people, this is above 90% believe there's nothing you can do about it. It's just, it's called aging. When they, if you ask the average uh, American, uh, what do they mean when somebody die, dies of natural causes, over almost 90% of them would say, well, he had a heart attack or stroke. That is not a natural cause of death. We've known how to treat this disease for 50 years. There's literally not one physician coming out of medical school that doesn't know how to treat this disease. So why, do you ask, do we have some, why is it so prevalent? Why have we, if you were, go back to the uh, epidemiology we, we did earlier in this presentation, you remember those lines were flat. In fact, they're going upwards. The trend is continuing upwards. We, we are having almost no effect to the incidence of heart attack or stroke nor an effect on the number of people who die from these uh, diseases. And why is that if we've known how to treat it effectively for 50 years? Well, the answer is, and, and Danny, if you were listening to his introduction, the number one gap in US healthcare system today is the gross underdiagnosis of this disease. We wait until people have a heart attack or stroke, then we treat them. So if you keep doing what you've always done, you're always gonna get what you've always got, Mr. Bateman taught us. What if, just uh, take a second to lean back in your chairs and play what if with me for just a second. What if there was a, a magical test somewhere that could catch 98% of all of the heart attacks and strokes before they occur? Wouldn't that be cool? What if there was such a thing, if we just imagine that for a second? What if we had a pregnancy test, so to speak, or a mammogram for heart disease? Wouldn't that be a cool thing? Don't you think we could make a difference in the world in terms of cutting these costs and the incidence of disease? What if we had this crystal ball that could clarify therapeutic need? Who, who needs to be on a statin? Who doesn't? What if you could stop worrying right now, 
to help better plan for your legacy, your future without health. Or what if you didn't have to worry about, you know, when you when you hit 60, most of us start worrying a little bit. Well, I don't know if I should shovel my walks anymore. <laughs> I don't want to have a heart attack. What if you could stop worrying about those things? Well, the, the answer is you can. In a 10-year, 100,000-person year study, I want to I want to dive into that for a second. So when we say a 100,000 person year study, that's a big study. That's following 10,000 patients for 10 years. One study caught 98% of the heart attacks and strokes before they occurred. And this is a cool study. What they did is they, they identified a cohort of, uh, they actually looked at, I think, about 18,000 patients, but they got it narrowed down to 10,000 patients who were asymptomatic, meaning these folks not only did they not have signs and symptoms for disease, but not one of them would have qualified for pharmacological intervention because they weren't sick. If they had high cholesterol, they couldn't be in their study. If, if they had low HDL, they couldn't be in the study. If they had high blood pressure, they couldn't be in the study, and so on and so forth. So if they had any of the traditional risk factors, they couldn't be in the study because this was important. They had them sign a waiver agreeing to not be treated for the 10 year period of the study. Now that was not unethical because none of these people qualified for care at the time at the onset of the study, uh, nor would they have qualified. Uh, there was one exception you ought to, we ought to make note of, about 39% of them were smokers. I, I'm cynical enough to believe that they might've left those in just so they had some, some uh, events to count, but this was a low risk group no traditional risk factors, asymptomatic, very safe group to study. Nevertheless, 21% of this group went on to have heart attacks or strokes in that 10-year window. What did we learn? Well, first of all, this technology I'm going to teach you about caught 98.6% of the events. Now, uh, let's talk about what 98% of the events, the, the, the a home pregnancy test catches 97% of the events. And we must remember that this is after they've already been affected. Pregnancy test is you already have the condition. We're just telling you have it. In, 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 uh, in the case of IMT, we're telling them that they're sick. We're, we're, we're predicting heart attack or stroke, but they haven't had it yet. So very, very significant. Uh, that rate, by the way, is only true if the test is performed correctly. So this is another test, a landmark study, uh, the atherosclerosis results in community, Atherosclero atherosclerosis results in community study, uh, a, a landmark study that is still used today because it was so significant. And what we found when I talk about hazard ratio, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I'll, I'll just hit this briefly, essentially a, two, a hazard ratio of 2.01 doubles your risk. So what they found is if a woman had uh, LDL cholesterol above 160 milligrams per deciliter, she was twice, her lifetime risk, she was twice as likely to have a heart attack or stroke than with somebody who did not have this condition, if that makes sense. I wish I could look into your eyes and get nods on whether you're tracking or not. And for a man, uh, just a little bit below that. So not at all, uh, if, if it's my mom and dad, I still want to know, doubling my risk, I, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I want to know about that, and I'm certainly going to act on that. And that, out of those numbers, came the statin class of drugs, which are known as cholesterol lowering. Turns out they do a lot more than that, but but they got their uh, package insert, they got their approval largely because they could affect and lower cholesterol. Okay, now let's talk about the so-called good cholesterol. If you had uh, HDL cholesterol below, by the way, uh, let me let me go back a second. 160 milligrams per deciliter, there's not a physician in the world, I don't think, that would allow their patient to get as high as 160 milligrams per deciliter, unless they had familiar hypercholesterolemia, which is a, a very nuanced and small group of people. Uh, there's not a physician in the world that would allow their patient to get this high without, without hitting them over the head with a statin. So that's way, way, way too high. The, the goal right now in ATP guidelines is below 100 milligrams per deciliter, just for reference. In, in, in the so-called good cholesterol, they wanted us to be above 35. So if you were below 35 and you were a woman, you would have a three, a three time, three and a half time increase in your lifetime risk of having heart attack or stroke or, or just below a threefold increase if you're a man. These are huge increases. So we want to pay attention to that. That's you know, if, if it's me or my family, I'm going to say, look, uh, dad or mom, if, you, if your cholesterol, if your HDL is below 35, we got to get it up. 
to it, which by the way, the Staten class helps with that as well. Now, here's the, something I want you to pay attention to. IMT, which is the technology, the one test that we're gonna talk about that could solve all of these problems. If you had an IMT above one, milli, one, uh, one uh, milli, milli, millimeter, sorry, thanks. If, you're, if you had an IMT be, uh, above one millimeter, you were 19 times, your lifetime risk increased nearly 19 fold. So that's a huge increase. And we'll talk about why this difference in men and women, but I just want you to, to think on that for a second. It's a huge difference. One little test that takes 10 minutes and has caught 98% of the events in a 10 year, 100,000 person year study. That's what we're talking about. So what is IMT? Let's just talk about what that is. It's a measurement of the intima and media layers of the of the artery in the carotid artery, generally the carotid artery. We also measure the femoral arteries, but but they're the most reproducible are, are up on the neck. It's a direct measure of generalized atherosclerosis. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, we literally put electronic calipers on on the on an image and and tell you how many millimeters thick that vessel is over over about a one centimeter region. And why is it good? Because the more inflamed you get, the thicker that gets. All the way to a plaque is actually multiple, uh, could be two or three millimeters uh, uh, thick. So, so we can actually see it's a direct measure of inflammation. And of course, when it turns into plaque, we, we have a direct measure of atherosclerotic plaque burden. So it allows assessment of individual risk of events versus the risk of disease. So I want you to understand that cholesterol, one of the reasons it's not as predictive is it is a measure, it's a risk of disease. If your cholesterol is high, you have a risk of getting atherosclerosis. With IMT, we're actually measuring the, the amount and quantifying the amount of atherosclerotic disease burden. So, so hopefully you heard it's a subtle difference, but a very important difference. It's predictive of both myocardial infarction or heart attack and stroke in both men or, and women. So what it is, this is, this is just a schematic of, a, of an artery going up the neck. And so we put the transducer on the neck and, they, and it shoots sound waves in and those sound waves bounce back. And we can get with, with precision, we can see exactly how thick or thin these, uh, the intima and media layers of the artery are, wall are. And so here's an actual picture. So what we're measuring is this this area in yellow. I'm just gonna flip back and forth. So you can see with your eyes, you can see that it's thicker down here than it is here. Let me just go back and forth and you can kind of image that. And that's a, a, a single image of IMT. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on the protocol, but, but uh, I, I will say this, that if you're gonna do IMT, you have to do it right. Uh, this is back to the atherosclerosis results and community study, and they they did IMTs on a group of patients. So in, and then they they put them all in cohorts. So in all of the group that had no coronary heart disease and the group that went on to have a heart attack or stroke, the difference between their uh, intima media thickness was as a group, the aggregated group, was only 0 0.08 millimeters. Now you you dentists work in millimeters all the time. Uh, you're one of the few people that understand what I mean by what a small difference this is. 0 0.08 millimeters. Uh, if we if we think of a, a normative distribution curve, the difference uh, from a standard deviation to get at the 95% confidence interval, you can't have a standard deviation more than plus or minus 0 0.02 millimeters, or you can't even determine who is sick and who's not. So so why do I tell you that? Because who you have do IMT matters and whether or not they have a protocol that can get them to a standard deviation at or below 0 0.02 millimeters. If they don't have that uh, and they haven't documented their coefficients of variability, they have no, they don't have a fighting chance of being able to tell you who is and who is not going to go and have a heart attack or stroke. So in a, in a, in a study we published back in 2010, our arithmetic difference was 0 0.002 millimeters. Now, let me tell you what I mean by difference. This was uh, 10 different sonographers, different patients, different equipment, different readers. So every coefficient of variability that you could have, we threw into the mix. And the total arithmetic difference was 
0.002, the standard deviation 0 0.02. On an absolute basis, we were 0 0.016 millimeters. That is, I'm not aware of another test in any genre of medicine that has reproducibility that good. It's, it's really outstanding. We're quite proud of that. And here's the thing you should know. Uh, every technologist that works for us has to pass a double-blind performance-based certification at these metrics or better or they don't or, or they don't work for cardio risk and that's important because getting it right matters if you're going to determine who is and who is not going to go on to have a heart attack or stroke or if you want to monitor therapy okay we're uh, I, I know danny uh, i can't see you but i imagine you're getting ner nervous i'm watching we're winding down here i'm watching the time uh, so uh, you're doing great uh, no worries what, what's that you're doing great. No worries. Oh, you got my so, confidence. I'm at a high confidence interval. <laughs> so I want to talk about image guided therapy. This is a relatively new new term that they're not even teaching in the medical schools yet. The, the idea is it's risk stratification versus image guided assessment. So what does that mean? It means that uh, if you are a primary care physician and you're and you're throwing you know prescribing statins, wouldn't it be nice to know if that was working? And wouldn't it be nice to know if if there was more to it than just your cholesterol level uh, that you were using as a as a tool to decide who should go on a statin and who shouldn't for life? By the way, and so uh, our metric looks something like this: we say uh, all adults over 30 ought to have this IMT test uh, technology that we're talking about. It's a test, by the way that I kind of explained what it is, but it, 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 it's, uh, it's non-invasive, so there's no needle sticks, no disrobing. It takes about 10 minutes of patient time. It's very easily tolerated. And uh, the, the, the sonographer just puts a little ultrasound transducer on your neck. It's the easiest thing in the world. But we recommend all adults over 30 get it. Why? Because we see disease, the Bogalusa study, we saw disease in children all the way down to eight years of age. By 30 years of age, we see plenty of people with marked disease. So we're just simply saying as a screening tool, 30 years and older is a rational approach. Now the American Heart or American uh, uh, American Heart Association, excuse me, recommends adults 45 and older. We say younger than, uh, than 45 and the reason is I have the largest database of IMT measurements in the world, I think, over 250 million measurements that tell me patients are getting this disease at earlier ages, and so we recommend 30. And 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 what does a screen mean? Well, if they're all green, so the results come back much like blood labs that you've seen. If they're all green, a, blood, a green blood lab is good. A, a red one is bad, means you're abnormal. If they're all green, they can come back and just check it every three to five years, kind of like you would a colonoscopy. If they have yellow or red, we recommend that they get scanned every every year. Why? Because they have the disease process in place. We want to keep an eye on it. We especially want to see if treatment or therapy is working. So if they're all green, why do we say, what's the difference between three and five years? That can be confusing. Let me specify that. If I had uh, a family history, meaning my father, my grandfather both had heart attacks at age 55, I would lean closer to a three every three years getting checked. If I had high cholesterol or familiar hypercholesterolemia or, or any, there, there's many, many risk factors. If I had those, I'd probably check every three years instead of every five. That's the only difference. If you have none of those things, no reason to check it any more uh, frequently than, than every five years. Now, if you're in the yellow or red category on your report, uh, you have moderate to high risk. And so we recommend treating it, looking at it annually. So what does our test results look like? It's a very simple report. I, I already spoke about green light, yellow light, red light. This is a patient with yellows and reds. So we have uh, an easy, the, probably the most common assessment people look at, although I wish it wasn't what they looked at first, is their arterial age, which this patient was 51 at the time of his test, but his arteries look closer to somebody who's 61. So there's a 10-year delta, meaning he's progressing faster than someone of his age and gender should because he looks 10 years older. Uh, and if we go down to the absolute measures of inflammation, we can see this patient has a moderate amount of inflammation in his arteries, and even worse, he's got plaque. So he's got the pimples in his arteries, and if one of those ruptures, this person's gonna have an event. And so uh, he falls back in this category here. So we have a, a how to interpret for our physicians and people that are using, they can get this online, but essentially we're looking for plaque first because if they have plaque, it's no longer a screening tool. It is a diagnosis. That means these people have the disease responsible for 70% of the heart attacks and strokes 
We no longer want to take anything for granted. We're going to treat them as if they're guilty. We're going to throw the book at them from a treatment perspective, probably pharmaceutically and certainly from a lifestyle standpoint. We do want to know, though, is the disease active? So there is a one little metric we're going to check. When we look at the kind of plaque they have, we want to know, is it old plaque? Is it healed? Or is it still a soft white head pimple? Or is it that cottage cheese flavor that, that's, uh, that's still vulnerable to rupture? These two categories uh, we can still work on and, and we'll still throw more drugs at them to heal that. When they get here, uh, they're out of the woods. That, that, that lesion is healed, but they might have other lesions systemically. So then the next thing, we're just gonna look at the amount of inflammation. That's, uh, let me just go back. That's this information right here, the average CCA mean and max. And again, it's green light, yellow light, red light. These are the alert values we're comparing it to. And it's not one of these things where we look at, are they mostly green or mostly yellow? No, each of, each of these risk factors stands on its own feet as a, as a predictor of future events. So uh, we don't average, we look at each, each risk factor on its own. In this case, they've got a moderate amount of inflammation. So in the how to treat, we look when they're yellow or red, we say, well, this person has plaque, so we're going to treat with aggressive lifestyle and pharma. We also look at, uh, is it hard plaque? No. His plaque was soft. So we're going we're gonna to also check this patient's femoral arteries just to see where else can we find disease. So what are the benefits of IMT testing to the patient? Well, it's early detection of disease. So it fixes the number one gap in U.S. healthcare, meaning that we, um, we're going to uh, identify the disease in time that we can treat it medically so that our only option is not just a surgical intervention. I think most people would agree that's a much better option. Think about teeth. We'd much rather catch them when we can scrape uh, plaque off rather than wait till they've got large scale periodontal disease and you have to do something uh, more invasive. It's a guide for therapeutic treatment. So what does that mean? Although we haven't proven this empirically, wouldn't it be nice to know that if your doctor puts you on a statin, you wouldn't necessarily have to stay on it for life. I can't make that statement yet, but we're working on that data. My opinion is that you do not have to be on your statin for life. Again, I, I wanna make it clear that I, I don't have empirical evidence on that yet, or at least not published. But we believe that it makes sense to track and say, well, once the fire's out, once I've got rid of the inflammation and your plaque is healed, why do I need to stay on the statin? And I think that's a question that, that needs to be answered in literature. It monitors the efficacy of therapy. Wouldn't it be nice to know if, geez, I've been on the statin therapy for three years, how come nothing's changing? So that the physician prescribing can know whether to double down the dose or you know, how, what else can I do to get to affect a change in the wall of this patient's arteries? It's a huge motivator. I can't tell you the emotional impact people feel the first time they get a report back that says, I've got plaque three and a half inches from my brain. It has an emotional impact that has been, that's been proven in literature to have an, uh, an effect towards uh, on patient compliance. So it's a wonderful patient compliance tool. Would it be nice to have those kinds of tools uh, in, in every profession. It's predictive in both men or women. And I can tell you that women were left off the table in a lot of the literature for cardiovascular disease until, believe it or not, the 1990s, which is horrific. It's terrible that we allowed that to happen. But in IMT, we have great data for both men and women. It's predictive in both. So why are we talking to a group of dentists about, about a tool that is clearly going to be managed in the primary care office? Let me tell you why. Um, CBD prevention myths mead, mislead patients, which often results in un unnecessary hospitalizations and, and a litany of tests that they get that do not tell them anything about their, about their future risk. So it's a huge cost to the system that's being done unnecessarily, where we could, with one very inexpensive test, we could tell them, this is what we're going to use. And so we can tell them if they're sick or not, and then what to do about it. Patients see their dentist on an average. Uh, Danny said this at the uh, uh, at, at the beginning. They see their their pay, their dentist five times as often as they see their primary care providers. What does that mean? Well, it means that they're trusting you, and you have in your hands a patient that if you choose to look at the patient more holistically and look at things like blood pressure and and maybe let's take a look at your arteries. Although you may not treat it, you, they're going to look at you with more credibility because you're, you're seeing them as a whole patient, not just as a mouth. 
And I think that's really important. So dentists often see the early indications of CVD. You see it in their oral biomes. We published a paper a while back. We found two bacteria in the mouth that are not just associated, but they're causative of cardiovascular disease. This bacteria and inflammation, you're seeing it. You're seeing on the gum line. You're seeing uh, in the oral pathogens, and you're seeing it in the in the uh, panoramic uh, 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 cone beams that you're doing. You're, you often can look and see in the carotids and see plaque there. So you're in a position to diagnose this disease early and say, hey, you, you, if you don't have a primary care doctor, you may want to go see one. What a tremendous and powerful impact you can have on this disease by jumping in early. Your trusted healthcare providers, patient, patients will listen to your recommendations, especially if you just simply say, hey, I saw this incidental to our exam and uh, maybe you ought to take a look at that. Adding heart attack and stroke prevention screening to your practice can generate additional revenue. We hope that's not the only reason people get involved. Hopefully they'll get involved for the other four reasons mentioned on here, uh, but it's going to save lives. If we catch this disease earlier, uh, we, can, we can treat it medically so we don't have to wait till it's uh, treated surgically. And remember, for the vast majority of patients, their first uh, symptom is the heart attack or stroke. They don't get the luxury of that pain in the chest or the numbing of their arm. Their first symptom is a heart attack or stroke and half of those die. And we're putting you in the driver's seat where you can make a difference to that. So the last uh, the last thing I'm gonna mention to you is this, this website. If you have interest and wanna know more, obviously there's a lot that I can't say in an hour presentation, but if you, if you go to this website, just cardiorisk.com forward slash provider, you can just fill out information. No salespeople are going to call you. They'll just send you information about how you can get involved if you're interested. Uh, and if you're not, we hope you'll always be an advocate to your patients about good health and wellness. Uh, never mind just heart attack and stroke prevention, but just good health, health and wellness. Such an important part for any credible, trusted healthcare advisor. Anyway, it's been wonderful to be with you. I'm going to leave time. I guess we'll open up the mics, Danny, and uh, any questions that you might have. I want to make sure uh, that, that we've got time to address those. Well, we do indeed. And I want to thank you very much for uh, a wonderful presentation. Uh, it's a uh, it's always timely, and it's 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 actually past time that people really pay attention and and get more into the uh, the preventative mode. And you know, even if the practice, even if you attendees don't choose to embrace or adopt this for your own practice, at a minimum, and I think as a first step in any case, you would be well served to reach out and and to Todd and get the test for yourself, maybe your family or your team. Um, I've had the test done, and uh, it was very enlightening. And it, you mentioned that it's motivational. It, it motivated me to – I actually scored pretty well, but, uh, it, you know, I'm, I'm competitive, and I always want to do better. And, and it motivated me to really take a good, close look at uh, the various, various lifestyle factors. I, I, I like your statement that, that movement is medicine. I hope people will take that to heart, as well as uh, – let food be thy medicine, which was said yes. by, I don't know if it was Socrates or Hippocrates or one of them. But let's dive into the questions because we do have several. Uh, first is, why would I, a dentist, want to utilize CIMT technology? Yeah, the, the, the reason, so first of all, it's easy to implement. Uh, you generally, uh, as you talk to patients that you think are at risk, particularly, I would tell you any patient that's got periodontal disease, I will almost guarantee you they're going to have cardiovascular disease. It's a direct pathway into the circulatory, for heaven's sakes. So those pathogens are going right from their mouth, right into the bloodstream. So, uh, so you're seeing the patients, and 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 so it's a it's a value add for your patients. We can do them right there in your practice. Uh, the, it, it only takes about 10 minutes. Per, we, we book 15 minute slots for them, but it takes us 10 minutes to do the scan and they can do it right in your office. But it's also, it, like I said, please don't do it because you want to make more money. But it, it does generate, we've, we've priced it such that, that you, the, the going price, you, you make about $150 a test. And, uh, and you'll just line up patients, you know, usually 15 patients for a half a day. And uh, so it's fast and easy, but it, it, it makes you more of a, of a whole person uh, healthcare advisor. And, and we, we think it really enhances 
particularly for people you've already found disease. You know, they, they got plaque, they got periodontal disease. It's just a natural next step to say, you know, why we've got you here. We'd like to, why don't you come in and let's check your arteries and and uh, I want to see how how far this disease has affected your system. And that that would be the logic from my perspective. Right. Well, and I can tell you, putting my marketer's hat back on here. Uh, there are a few better ways to differentiate your practice than to demonstrate a commitment to what we call oral systemics or whole person dentistry. Uh, we we research and and pay attention to what people are searching online and to what resonates with them. And people are more and more expressing interest in, in a healthcare provider that recognizes these links and doesn't just want a dentist who has essentially been viewed as a tooth carpenter. I, so, I think, Danny, if I yeah. could insert there to, to to your point, you know, if you had to be an expert and you had to go to a week long class to learn everything there was about this, it, it may not be a fit. But this this is such an easy thing to implement. We come in, we provide all of the services. You're just going to hand them a report at the end of the at the end of the day that says, hey, uh, I think you need to have somebody look at this because now mm -hmm. I found it in your mouth and it looks like your crowded arteries loaded and it's just a real value added and you don't have to spend, you don't have to be an expert on any of this to, to use it in your practice effectively. Yeah. So I want to emphasize. And that was a couple of questions that I got, which um, I think spoke, I, you know, in, in the introduction, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the research you'd done on operator dependent coefficients of variability and testing reproducibility, which I think is, yeah. is a nice way of saying, let the experts do this. because uh, <laughs> just, you know, It is. Yes. Yeah. Which, uh, so you basically, for for a practice to uh, uh, adopt this this model of this service, they basically would sort of have a special day that they would arrange to line up yep. patients, and then you would come out or have arrange for people to come out and do the testing and they share the results. They take up one chair for a half a day, uh, usually once a month or once a quarter, however often you want us. But here's the important thing: you don't spend one dollar until you've been paid. So we, we don't bill you till 30 days after they've already been in and been scanned. And you're probably going to collect payment at the time of service. So you're going to have the money in your pocket. There's no out of pocket for you. And, and that's important to note, too. My, my son is a dentist, by the way, in Corvallis. And, and uh, he's always saying, yeah, but dad, I don't want to spend money for a black box. No, no, no. There's no there's no cash outlay for you. I see. I did not know your son was a a, a dentist. I should have. And that's 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 Washington. I've got one that is a dentist that's been practicing for three years, and I got one that's headed to dental school. So, if any of you oh, want to give him a, a recommendation, he's a bioengineer, but he's trying to get in right for fall semester. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's great. Um, well, we've sort of covered the uh, next question. This was sent early, which is what's in it for me and my patients to offer this. Uh, yeah. I think good health and. Uh, uh, appreciation and uh, referrals and, and all the rest. Anything else you care to add to that? No, I think that's it. And like I said, uh, dentists seem to do quite fine on the revenue side, but there is a little revenue stream for you, certainly to cover your overhead. And um, mm -hmm. But I think it's more really the messaging, the, the, yes. the branding, if you will, that my dentist yeah. cares enough yeah. to arrange arrange sessions like this. I think that's huge. I think it's very astute of you. Yeah, I think that's spot on, Danny. And and I, and I I guess you could go into some detail because the next question is how would my practice get involved with cardio risk? So that's if they'll just go to this the the way to launch it. Nobody's going to call you unless you unless you want. But normally uh, on this provider page, there's a place for you to give us the name of your practice manager, whoever you want us to contact. So we're not bugging you. It's a one call. That's all. We. We send all of the patient brochures, the posters to hang up, all of the advertisements, the, the video loop that you can run in your waiting area if you want. All of that we'll take care of. We, we, we're very sensitive about provider's time, so we won't bother you unless you ask us to. Most of the time, we'll just tell, point us to who you want us to talk to, and we'll walk them through step-by-step step how to implement it. Okay, but that's that's actually uh, interesting uh, news as well, that in addition to the testing Sounds like you provide some collateral marketing material. You yeah, mentioned the we, video. We'll, we'll handle everything. Anything that you want. We don't mandate any of it, right? But we have we've been doing this 30 years. So we have we have all of the tools for uh, you know letting the patients know about it so that you don't we, we're not trying to make you our salespeople or anything like that. We just 
if, if you'll just say, hey, if you you know, did you see the did you see the video running on on the cardiovascular disease? And I think yeah, if if a, if a provider will simply ask their patients to get it done because you're worried about particularly those with with periodontal disease, they really ought, like I, he can almost guarantee they're going to have it. And why don't we help those people get to the next step of of care? Uh, th those are who we're worried about. Um, are people actually able to, because uh, that really piqued my interest, if people go to your website, do they, are they able to, or in other ways, see examples of the communications materials that you provide? Uh, yes, so there there are links. I, I can tell you that it all starts with, with this. There's a, a little form they fill out on this provider page. If they'll fill that out and point us to who we should talk to, We'll send we'll send samples of everything they they want to look at so they can decide. We're nobody's we're we don't have enough people to be twisting arms. So so there's there's no you know person that's going to call and bug you every week. It, it's just simply we'll send stuff a packet out to you so you can see if you want to get involved or not. Yeah, no, I think the point has been abundantly made that there's not going to be any uh you know no salesman will call. So uh, yeah, I think it's good that that you make that point. Uh, uh, this well, is something we'll that service you. We, you we will answer your questions, but they're not going to be. Yeah, it's, it's yeah like you're going to wait to you're going to wait for the questions to be asked, and that's yeah. great. Okay, uh, how much time does the procedure take per patient? Yeah, it's normally 15 minutes of patient time. That's that's from the time our sonographer goes to the waiting room to invite him back, get him on the chair, uh, you know, put a little tissue on the so they don't get uh, ultrasound gel on their collar. But it's generally 15 minutes. They're in and out. Mm hmm And I guess the next question, I could probably just do the math. But how many patients can an average office scan in a typical day? Yeah. So we routinely have uh, it's it's about 20 patients in a half a day. So mm -hmm. you know you schedule every 15 minutes. Yeah, you can do the math. Yeah, and if you can do 20 patients in a day, that's great. That's 20 patients you've helped. Uh, how is your system capable of distinguishing between types of plaque? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Very astute, whoever asked that. So the uh, we use a, a proprietary software that, that looks at if you know what densitometry is. I'm sure you do because you're looking at images all the time. But it, it basically looks at the the the, the gray scale sent by the sound waves. So a, a bright white is echogenic, uh, meaning it's it's a lot of speckle and it means it has a lot of cal calcium and collagen just like on your cone beams. And then if the darker it is, uh, the softer it is. But it's it's Very all densitometry and, and it's on a 100 point scale and we put them into one of three groups, soft, heterogeneous, okay. or uh, echogenic. And that's how you got, uh, translate it into the, I guess the volume as well as the, the composition would determine the color, uh, red, Yellow well, green. it's it's uh, yeah, it's actually the sound wave. So so it's uh, what happens is it, without getting into the physics of ultrasound, what happens is the sound waves bounce. They hit a surface and bounce back, and they bounce back at different frequencies. So so uh, a, a dense, a highly dense material, the sound waves can't penetrate, so they bounce back sooner, and that shows up as bright white on the screen. And 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 it's a it's a scale of zero to 100. So the more speckle, the more those sound waves bounce back, and the and the and the less dense or the softer it is, the sound waves penetrate through through. So they they'll go all the way through the the artery and, and hit a different surface, and so that that sound wave comes back and it and it shows up as a as a dark black signal, if that makes sense. Yep, it does. All right. You reference your test as being an emotional motivator. Do you also recommend therapy to reverse the, the effects your test identifies, or is that left to us? <laughs> you know, I, we joke about that, but but we we actually in Salt in our, we have an office here in Salt Lake that we occasionally have people fly in. They want to they want me to do it for whatever reason, and uh, and we <laughs> uh, please don't laugh, but we we actually have a psychiatrist in our office with us. Not for that, we. It just worked out. She rented space from me, but, but fortuitous. Uh, you do have some people that get quite worked up, but no, generally therapy is not needed. Yeah. All right. Well, that was great. Uh, thanks very much uh, again. Uh, thanks great. everyone for the posing the questions. And uh, let me just share that in a few days you will receive an email with instructions on how to apply for your CE credit. 
And at this time, I now want to invite you to mark your calendars for Thursday, February 17th at 6 p.m. Central Time, when my guest will be Mr. Joe Rossi, whose presentation is entitled Practice Transitions and Growth Mastery, the exciting and rewarding journey from startup to exit. You can see the range of topics that we feature here on Practice Perfection. They run the gamut from clinical to practice management, which makes for, I, I hope you agree, uh, interesting and uh, stimulating dialogue. Uh, the, practice, the present practice climate makes it an exciting time to contemplate a practice purchase or transition into retirement. Joseph Rossi and Associates offers a diverse set of real estate and practice transition solutions for healthcare professionals. As an attendee, you will learn options for entering practice ownership, understand current market conditions and how they affect the practice transition, master the pricing and lending process for rapid increased ROI, demystify the dental practice startup process, gain a clear comprehension of the practice valuation and selling timeline, and be shared the most important factors to consider when buying a practice. It all happens on Thursday, February 17th at 6 p.m. Until then, this is Danny Bobro thanking you for your continuing commitment to practice perfection and thanking you again, Todd, for a wonderful presentation. My pleasure. Goodbye, everybody.